Um, Jenny. Okay, so hello everybody. I am Patrick Jenny and I'm chairing this uh, invited talk by Marie uh, Ronis uh, from Simula Research Laboratory. Just uh, to say a few words about uh, Marie Ronis. Um, she's chief research scientist and research professor in the scientific computing and numerical analysis at the Simula Research Laboratory in Oslo, Norway. She received her PhD from the University of Oslo in 2009. It was an extended stay uh, with the university uh, at the University of Minneapolis, uh, Twin Cities, Minneapolis, US. And she has been at the Simula Research Laboratory since 2009 and led its department for bio, biomedical computing from 2012 till 2016 and currently leads a number of research projects focusing on mathematical modeling and numerical methods for brain mechanics, including an ERC starting grant in mathematics. And uh, Marie Aronis uh, won the 2015 uh, Wilkinson Prize for Numerical Software, the 2018 Royal Norwegian Society of uh, Sciences and Letters Prize for Young Researchers within the Natural Sciences, and was a founding member of the Young Academy of uh, Norway. So now, um, Marie, we are very interested in hearing what you are going to tell us in the next uh, 30 minutes. So. So you should be able to start, I guess. Um, Marie, you are still mm -hmm. muted. We cannot hear you. Uh, Marie, um, something with your, with, your, with your audio okay. doesn't work. Is this better? Yeah. Yes, now better. it's good. Now it's good. Thank you. Okay, can you see my slides as well? Yes. No. Yes. And okay. Please so please everybody think... else stay muted. Yeah. Pardon? So I just said that everybody else should mute the microphone during the talk. Okay, so thank you so very much. Um, let me start by telling you a story. So in 1787, the Italian anatomist and geologist Paolo Mascagni published a masterpiece. It was a nearly complete anatomical map of the entire human lymphatic system. And he included detailed representations of lymph vessels surrounding the brain. But then by some um, stroke of uh, historical misfortune, Mascani's discovery of these lymph vessels surrounding the brain were um, dismissed. They were ridiculed and forgotten. And so it was for more than 200 years. But then in 2015, lymphatic vessels in the membrane surrounding the brain were rediscovered. This was hailed as one of the biggest scientific discoveries of 2015. So there are lymphatic vessels in almost the entire body from uh, your leg, the peripheral, up to including in the membrane surrounding the brain. But, and this is a big but, there are no lymph vessels in the brain itself. And the lymphatic system plays several roles, but one is to clear water and metabolic waste from the tissue. And considering that your brain consumes about 25% of your metabolic energy, it's rather strange that there's no lymphatic vessels in there. Clearing metabolic wastes seems like something the brain would need. So this begs the question, what plays the role of the brain's lymphatic system? And the interesting is that nobody knows. Now you may be thinking, why should I be interested in the brain's lymphatic system? Well, take a look at this. So what you're looking at here is an illustration of brain cells and the space between brain cells. The brown blurbs here are so-called amyloid beta plugs. The blue things are tau tangles. Both of these 
these lumps and tangles are hallmark characteristics of Alzheimer's disease. Both amyloid beta and tau are naturally occurring byproducts of your metabolism. So their presence is natural, but the aggregation, these protein aggregations uh, are not. We do not know how these lumps form and we do not know their precise role uh, in um, the disease or the progression of the disease. But we do know that Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, a number of these neurodegenerative diseases are associated with these abnormal protein aggregations. We know that they're uh, correlated with massive cell death and with cognitive decline. So our kind of basic premise is that if we, could it be that if we better understand the brain's tra transport pathways, the brain's clearance route and the interplay between fluids and structures in the brain, then maybe we could also have better understanding of these neurodegenerative diseases. So, <clears throat> Before um, I continue, let me just give you a 101 crash course in brain anatomy. So the brain parenchyma in light brown here is surrounded by cerebrospinal fluid and connected to the spinal canal. The brain is surrounded by three membranes, the dura, the, uh, the arachnoid membrane and the pia membrane. Between the arachnoid and the pia membrane, there's the subarachnoid space that's filled with CSF. Blood vessels line the brain surface and they also dive into the brain, both arteries and veins. So with so much that's not known, let's see what do we know. So what happens if you inject a tracer, which is a biological dye essentially, into the cerebrospinal fluid, the CSF, in the spinal um, compartment? So for instance, the, whoops down here around C6 in the spinal cord. If you'd injected this tracer, there's a dye in the bloodstream that would not reach the brain because of the blood-brain barrier. But what happens if we inject it in the CSF? Well, what happens is that the solute, this tracer, was spread into the entire brain in the matter of hours and days. And then somehow it will clear again in the matter of days or maybe weeks. And what you see here is a rather unique data. It's the MRI images of the spread of tracer in human brain collected by our collaborators Pakistan uh, Aida and guiding at Oslo University Hospital and they're the only team in the world that has this as a part of their clinical procedure. So it tells you something about the rarity of these data and you can also see something about how it, they're sparse in time. So you typically this is very high frequency in time and that's every maybe three hours or so. Now in animals, you can of course experiment a bit further and you can look in more detail. And it seems that the tracer uh, enters into the brain through so-called perivascular spaces, first in the brain surface and then deeper into the brain. These perivascular spaces are spaces surrounding and running along the blood vessels. And this is not a static process, it's a dynamic process and it's influenced by a number of lifestyle factors. For instance, sleep has a positive effect. Sleeping mice have faster tracer spread than awake mice. Exercise has a positive effect. And importantly, even alcohol, a moderate amount of alcohol has a positive effect, but not a large amount. So this is a super exciting field. Um, it's a, also a field filled with controversy and a number of open questions. Um, some of the big questions are, what are the mechanisms underlying influx and clearance in the brain and its environment? And are the forces and spaces sufficient to create these uh, fluid pathways? And really for computational modeling and simulation, this is a frontier field um, and it's quite new. And in the remainder of this talk, I'll show you how we use what we call then computational brain fatigues. Um, to address the first two questions here. And our focus is really on providing physics-based insights into potential physiological mechanisms uh, and evaluating current hypotheses. And I'll also highlight how this um, physiological problem setting creates interesting numerical challenges. But when I say me, we, I really mean my wonderful team here at Simla, our collaborators at Oslo University Hospital, Oxford and beyond, 
and in particular my former students Matteo Cracci, Marius Kausemann, Vega Vinia, and Eleonora Piersanti. Okay, so recall that a tracer injected in the spinal canal will spread into the entire brain in the matter of 24 to 48 hours. And clinical doctors say and state that it's unlikely that diffusion alone explains the brain-wide distribution. Now, this is a claim that we can easily investigate using computational modeling, right? That's what we did. So we created families of models starting from MRI images of how the tracer spread in the spinal compartment. We extracted the concentration of tracer in the subarachnoid space and used it as a boundary condition for computational models of diffusion in the brain. In addition, the uncertainty in the different coefficients here is substantial. So we also studied uncertainty in diffusion fields and potential convection, um, convection velocity fields, both heterogeneous and homogeneous. Then we ran Monte Carlo and computed a number of quantities of interest, including the total amount of tracer in the gray matter, which is the outer region, and the total amount of tracer in white matter, the inner regions, and also average concentrations in local areas. So the first thing we did was just to consider diffusion alone, and then we also considered diffusion and convection. So as the tracer spreads up along the spinal canal, it will also start spreading on the brain, up on the brain surface, and start spreading within the brain. And the time scale here is comparable with what's observed in clinical experiments. We found that the expected amount of tracer in the gray matter peaked in around 15 hours, which was in agreement with what they find clinically, actually. So this means that in the gray matter, diffusion seems to, well, do, to a large extent, well explain the observations. However, the, in the white matter, the picture was different. There, the expected amount of tracer was still increasing after 24 hours, um, and it seems like something more would be needed there. It was also important to note that we, from the uncertain diffusion coefficient, led to really substantial variation in all outputs, and this was a dominant source of uncertainty. So, if there is an aspect of convection that plays a role, what could it be? Well, the current leading hypothesis in this community is something called the glymphatic theory, the glymphatic system. This is a popular but also much disputed hypothesis. And the glymphatic theory states that there's a convective flow through the brain. It's a flow that of cerebrospinal fluid in along perivascular spaces on the arterial side through the um, extracellular spaces and then out on the v through perivascular spaces on the venous side. Now how do you model such a theory on the macro scale? Well we ended up you representing this using random fields. We considered two approaches, one with the local directionality representing this glymphatic theory. So we could represent this glymphatic influx as a velocity field that would conserve mass, that would respect the average um, distance between arteries and veins, uh, but still have this aspect of um, uh, kind of arterial influx and venous outflux. But what we found using that velocity field that was only local directional was that it did not enhance trace transport. So that model would not explain an enhanced transport. So therefore we looked and saw, okay, what could, what could more would one need to add to this hypothesis? The one thing that we can add would be a global directionality in the convective velocity field. So by including also the global directionality following the, the, the pathway of the blood, from uh, below and up and out, we could enhance transport somewhat, not to a large extent, but somewhat. Now, in order to dig, <clears throat> dig further into this, we need to look more on the brain and its material properties. So the brain is a surprisingly soft tissue, and it's also rheolog rheologically very complex. But at the time scales and spatial scales we're looking at here, so we're looking at from seconds, hours to days, and the whole organ level, the brain, brain is perhaps best represented as a poroelastic medium. More generally, you can view it as a generalized poroelastic medium, an elastic tissue that's permeated by multiple networks of fluids 
you have the blood vessels, you have possible paravascular spaces, you have the extracellular network and intracellular networks, all filled with fluids from blood to different variations on water. And you have transport within each network, but also exchange between the networks. Fortunately, the multiple network pore elastic theory is a macroscopic model that would seem ideally suited for targeting this setting. So the core idea behind this theory is that you consider a homogenized piece of um, tissue. You have an elastic structure permeated by different fluid networks. For instance, a small pore scale one, a larger fracture one, and you consider the combined material and then you homogenize. Concretely, the equations read as follows. So these multiple network elasticity equations describe the displacement U and network pressures PJ for a number of Js, maybe ranging from one, if you just have one fluid network, to maybe six, if you consider a complex brain model. And then you have such the balance of momentum and balance of mass holds. In addition, for these, where you have more than one network, you also describe the fluid exchange between the networks. And here we assume that that would be driven by a pressure difference between the networks. J equals one corresponds to the classical BIOS equations. There's a number of interesting parameter regimes here. When lambda becomes the parameter lambda, the make coefficient becomes very big. You have the incompressible regime. If KJs are very small, you have low permeabilities. But now, of course, these interesting parameter regimes are often also interesting numerically and often challenging numerically. So if you'd like to discretize these equations using, say, a finite element approximation, one needs to be careful. It's easy to get, for instance, in the incompressible limit, when lambda is big, to get these locking type effects, or that you can also see by typically a loss of convergence. So we were interested in remedying this. We're using these equations as kind of a basic building block for our models. We need to be able to discretize them accurately and robustly. So we're interested in trying to remedy this loss of convergence, the optimal rate should be two, we see observed convergence rates of one. In order to do so, we're inspired by Lee Mardell and Winter for BIO and also similar works for elasticity where we introduce an additional variable called the total pressure. P0 as the sum of the elastic pressure and the fluid pressures. The effect of introducing this additional variable and additional constraints is that we're transforming this system in block form here into, instead of a two by two block, we now have a three by three system uh, describing U, P0 and P. But the key point is that when lambda goes to infinity in the original formulation, this block would blow up well, in the new total pressure formulation, these terms would vanish. And so, um, and the remaining formulation is still well published. So we can then prove that these, um, this method will converge optimally even in the lamp limit as lambda goes to infinity. And we also support this by numerical examples. So we're using this um, multiple network pore elasticity as a basic building block in more complex models. In particular, let's look at how we can enlighten and look at mechanisms underlying brain pulsatility in response to arterial blood influx. And now we are in um, the kind of the clinical settings and everything's in millimeters per mercury. So let me just remind you, one millimeter mercury is about 100 pascals. So there's a famous Norwegian rock song called The Brain is Alone. But the brain is not alone. The brain is in an intricate interplay with its environment, with the blood, with the cerebrospinal fluid and surrounding compliances. Now, something that one can measure is the arterial blood flow into the brain. So these are examples here. But something that's much more difficult to measure is, for instance, the displacement of the brain or the intracranial pressure, ICP. This can only be measured invasively. Some things are known of the ICP, though. It's known that it varies in time and it varies, pulsates in sync with the cardiac and respiratory cycle with an amplitude of maybe full to eight millimeters of mercury. Much less is known about pressure gradients, 
but we've had access to a unique data set, long-term simultaneous recordings of pressure measurements inside the brain that allow, by analyzing those, we were able to identify a pulsatile pressure gradient was consistent in the brain with an amplitude of up to one to two millimeters of mercury per meter. So these are the type of pressure magnitudes we are, uh, what has been observed. These are still rare and sparse measurements. So we're interested in seeing, can we relate these arterial inflow data to such uh, pressure gradients and such pressure um, amplitudes in time? So this is something we model as a coupled per elastic viscous system. This, all this work is done by Marius Kausemann in his thesis. So we considered the brain as a poroelastic medium using AMPED1 or BO and the surrounding Stokes um, fluid over image-based uh, geometries of the brain, the ventricular system inside and the surrounding cerebrospinal fluid. As a source, we apply this arterial blood flow. So blood flows into the entire parenchyma uh, and it varies in time. This is one cardiac cycle. So let's see what we get. So now you're looking at the predictive displacement of the brain parenchyma in response to the arterial influx. So now there's a constant arterial influx in the entire parenchyma. This is several cycles. And what you can observe is this drives the brain downwards and backwards with a displacement around up to 0.2 millimeters. Now measuring brain displacement during each cardiac cycle is very tricky, but this is believed to be kind of in line with clinical um, measurements. We can then also look at the fluid um, velocity and the pressures in the surrounding CSF. And again, we see that these homogeneous inflow creates these dynamical and heterogeneous um, patterns. In the beginning of systole, fluid flows down from the cranial compartment, down into the spinal cord, up into the aqueduct. You have several flow reversals and you see velocities of up to 20 millimeters per second. Our predicted intracranial pressure, so you can see it, it starts low um, and then it rises quickly uh, within what seems to be a physiological range and also small, but some pressure gradients are there. So to summarize, we also simulate these, um, sorry, compare these simulation results to other clinical measurements, which to some extent, uh, large extent compare well. We can look at detailed um, mechanisms such as the effect of the compliance of the spinal cord and how that affects pressure pulses. And it really offers an unprecedented detail for understanding mechanisms and individual variability. So with that, let me thank you for the attention. Uh, and in particular, thank all my collaborators, the students, and in particular, Pigris and Aida and Geiringsta, our clinical collaborators, are very generous with their data. Thank you. So thank you very much, Mary, for this very nice and interesting presentation. And now the floor is open for questions. Please, uh, the easiest is if you, if you just speak up. I try to keep uh, an eye on the, on the chat. Okay, just to break the ice, I start with, uh, with a question. Um, I mean, you have many tuning parameters. Essentially what you have is a multimedia um, model for, for the brain. As you said, there are many fluid networks and exchange coefficients and boundary conditions. And I think in the last example you showed uh, compliance uh, is of course a very critical uh, parameter in order to get these right pressure uh, response curves. And um, how did you tune those? For now we haven't tuned them. So this, what you're asking is an, is an interesting um, question because it says something about the, our current perspective. So using modeling and simulation to address these uh, brain uh, tissue mechanics, brain mechanics and brain flow is, is really a frontier field. So it's mechanisms are poorly known, models are kind of 
there's no established models in a way. So what we're trying now is not to kind of perfectly uh, predict or perfectly replicate observations, but we're trying to maybe evaluate hypotheses. I think Oliver Rolle mentioned this also in his, in his um, talk on Monday that modeling and simulation in physiology is just at a whole different level than in more kind of established, um, established field. So we haven't really tuned them um, yet. We're more asking this question, if it was like this, what, what would be? Um, yeah, but yeah. there are some of these parameters are, are relatively well known. So some of these, such as the diffusion tensor can be measured via diffusion tensor imaging, for instance. Um, transfer coefficients are very poorly understood. Um, I just think, I mean, when you when you show these um, these nice these nice simulations where where you see how the pressure basically um, oscillates and diffuses into the domain periodically, mm -hmm. um, you, you you use a completely homogenized model, as, as, you, as you said, a multi multimedia model, um, but at least in the in the vascular uh, fluid network. There are also very large uh, coherent structures. There is a hierarchy of, uh, of vessel types. So these, if I understood correctly, these are not taken into account here. In, in this model, what I present now, that we're not taking this into account now. We are also considering studies where we are considering more, more networks, where we're also at, um, accounting for uh, different blood networks, so arterial, capillary, and venous blood networks as well. So one can do that as well. And, and we don't have a, in a way, have a, this first um, couple model here is in a way rather cool, as we're just considering one fluid network. Yeah. I just wait yeah, for- raised for, hand. I have questions. Can you hear me? Please, please go ahead. Please go ahead because it doesn't otherwise work. Thank you very much. It's highly interesting, your, your uh, lecture, and it's closely related to problems we have been studying for a long time. Essentially, uh, the problem comes up in brain infarcts, because if you have, it's a, 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 then you create a, a hypoxia locally, and this changes the, uh, sub, the, the, also the water flow. When uh, we studied for brain cells, the influx and swelling of a single cell, but we have the next step to the system of blood vessels. And there it's coming up exactly what, uh, uh, what we had before arguments. We have to study more in detail the water influx through the, through the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, we, we, I think we have some tools now because we can better understand how the permeability uh, for the water for the fluid flow through the blood vessels can happen, but it's a, a, the problem of we have capillary structure. We have not just last large parts. It would be highly interesting if you could comment on this blood water transport from the blood vessel system, maybe also for some kind of lymphatic system, which is usually very much neglected because we have no, don't have very many contributions as far as the of simulation of the lymphatic system. Uh, so can what I can comment? comment, yes, I can comment. So we are looking at, we've been looking at um, some modeling and understanding the interplay between, uh, or, or trying to model and see what model can tell us about the uh, interplay between arterial, capillary, and venous blood flow, and also para um, arterial, para capillary, para venous flow. We mainly looked at kind of purely compartment models for now, so just ODEs, in order to understand what type of pressure conditions that need to be present in the outside uh, and the inside for any of these theories to at all make sense. But we were also, um, we haven't done this yet, but we're also interested in looking at more of these um, 
more explicit geometrical representation of blood vessels and paravascular spaces embedded in a piece of tissue. So for instance, you could have these uh, one dimensional networks, curves or lines uh, of blood vessels surrounded by spaces and then examine the, uh, the flow from the blood vessel, paravascular space and into the tissue. We're also but looking it, at, yeah. It, it's a case of capillaries. You no longer can read this. You have to go to the, mole, to the molecular structure because, yeah. uh, or at least, uh, which you usually cannot describe by, by some, some normal PDEs. It's not possible anymore. No, so we're, currently we're either looking at kind of two, either two scales, either at this micro level where we're looking at things of the size of cells, so glial cells, uh, capillaries, neurons. Okay, okay. then you can then, then we uh, can look at the micro scale water movement. Um, that's very interesting and feel free to we can talk more about this. Uh, we should stay in contact because it's yeah. one of the problems where we started from in this. Uh, uh, we were asked the questions by a, a neuroscientist who had to decide to open up uh, 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 the brain scientists who, uh, and medical people who had to open up the, the, the skull because of giving room to, to, the, uh, to, to the brain because otherwise yeah. people would have died. There's a lot of interest in this on the physiological side, so there's much more data coming out on uh, on the water movement these days. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, My pleasure. So thank you, thank you too. And I think uh, due to the time, we should uh, stop here. I'm sure uh, you can contact Mary Aronius for further questions via uh, email. And uh, here is, I would like to thank you again, Mary, for this very interesting and inspiring talk and uh, to the rest of us for attending. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.